Uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and thanks for joining me in this video. I'm G. Bruce Greer. I'm reading from books in my uh, uh, New Covenant Understanding series, and the book that I'm reading from today is this one. Oops, got it over there. Entitled The Compassionate, Merciful, Slow to Anger, Covenantally Faithful, and Contingently Purposeful Wrath of God and subtitled A Hebraic and New Covenant Understanding of God's Wrath. So um, uh, let me open a prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and Holy Spirit, once again, we turn to you. Uh, we turn to your word for revelation, but without your spirit to guide us, illuminate, and inspire us, to speak meaning to us both individually and, and broadly in the body of Christ, that we are uh, like that carnal man that, Apostle Paul speaks of First Corinthians that, that the things that of God are foolishness to us. So we need your help. We call upon you, and may you inspire both me and my sharing and the listener to discern and hear uh, by your Holy Spirit what you have to say to each one of us individually in this body of Christ. So in this, I pray that we would see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and walk with you more nearly individually and as the body of Christ, day by day, today included in Jesus' name, amen. So we are now uh, moving on in the book. We're in chapter, in part three, uh, chapter 13. And uh, what we've done, uh, part one dealt with some necessary background that we had to go through. And then part two dealt with God's eternal nature and his temporal ways. And then we're, this book is is looking at now narrowing down to look for incidences of God's wrath in the scriptures and trying to see if we can determine if we can learn more about God through uh, these examples where we may may or may not find his wrath. So um, this part three then is looking um, for God's wrath seen or unseen along covenantal lines. So uh, previous chapters, uh, and I've broken part three up into five segments. First two are chapters um, 11 and 12 are judgment scene uh, against human beings in the biblical narrative against people that God is not in covenant with. And we broke that, I broke that down into two groups. First, those that are not in covenant with the Lord and, uh, but not in opposition to his, eternal purposes or threatening his purposes for his covenant people. And we had several examples of that, including Adam and Eve and uh, so on. Then the chapter 12, which was just preceding this, we looked at people, examples where God brought judgment uh, against uh, people not in covenant, but in direct opposition to God himself or to his purposes for his covenant people. And, um, uh, you can go back and look at those. The main thing I want to draw that for the, our purposes is that we found no examples of any anger on God's part, as people might traditionally define wrath. A God was not angry in bringing judgments. And so I've made this comment before. I don't find the biblical case that God executes divine intervention in the form of judgments uh, in anger. Uh, that's not uh, part of his nature. Wrath is not part of his eternal nature, nor is it in among his temporal ways to make judgments out of wrath. He makes judgments where he's needed for good and eternal purposes. And we've seen that in previous chapters. So now the next several chapters, we're going to look at God who has entered into covenant with different peoples and there's different covenants uh, briefly and um I want to just speak a word about the nature of covenants because uh, we're not, as Westerners, really uh, all that familiar with covenants. We don't particularly make covenants like they did in the ancient Near East at the time that the scriptures were written. And in these uh, biblical covenants, uh, parties would join together in kinship relationships. The covenant itself would make them family, family members of one, with one another closer than they could be with other people. So uh, to help our Western minds, I've used the example. Uh, in the West, we make contracts. 
and these are not at all like covenants. Uh, although some covenants have some contractual elements to them, they're much uh, stronger binding. They're not only uh, creating a kinship relationship, but they're under divine sanctions, meaning God himself is brought into these relationships in forming these uh, covenants. So an example I like to use is, uh, I'm well, right now uh, we're in the process of having a painter do some work in our, in our condo. And so I'm on a contractual basis with this painter to do certain work. And it's spelled out what the painter is going to do. And then my obligations in this are to pay the painter, do certain other things. But those uh, rights and obligations on the two parties are well-defined. But once the, the contract is completed, then our relationship, at least in that contractual sense, is over. Uh, now that's fairly, that's typical of a contract. Co uh, kinship covenants, however, uh, are altogether different nature. By becoming family members, that would be like having my painter uh, join my family in some way. Uh, maybe the painter marries my sister, and now by his marrying my sister has now become part of my extended family. I'm part of a family. Uh, and in a sense, and that's really the nature of uh, ancient uh, biblical covenants. So we're going to look at, uh, let's see, we're going to look at uh, four covenants. The first one we'll be looking at in this chapter is uh, the Noahic covenant. Then we're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant, followed by the Mosaic, or called the Old Covenant, and then the New Covenant. So those are four cases we'll look at. And in each case, we're going to be looking to see, uh, is there any anger or wrath on God's part? So let's just uh, start now. Chapter 13, I'm going to read the text. Uh, chapter 13 and 14 are very short. So the videos will be short, and I don't think I'll probably add very much to what the content of the uh, of these chapters is. So chapter 13 is God's wrath under the Noahic covenant. Uh, first heading is Noah as a type for Christ, and the ark as a type of the body of Christ. Let me pause this for a second. Um, let's pick this up again. The um, I'm reading the subtitle, Noah is a type for Christ, and the ark is a type of the body of Christ. We uh, all probably know the story, as is often the case in the Old Testament stories, however, there are multiple levels of meaning. We've already seen how the bulk of, let me pause there. Um, I, pause again here. I want to just make a minor comment here about uh, the stories in the Old Testament having multiple meanings. Among these is, is typological value. Now, by typological, that may be a term you're familiar with, but basically um, God in his divine wisdom uh, chose to share stories for, for many, many different reasons, uh, practical and theological and I would say, and many people identify, that there are many, many examples where there's a war story in the Old Testament representing not just, um, in, uh, uh, in this case of Noah and his family, a true historical event and case. I, I believe many people hold that, but also it has a significance to it in a symbolic way. So then Noah becomes... Um, a type of uh, ultimately a fulfillment of a new, uh, and we're looking for antitypes being in uh, New Testament realities. So another way of saying that is that I think that um, any really strong, robust New Testament teaching has uh, confirmation would be the way I would see it in typology we find in the Old Testament. So there's a great deal of value, I believe, in typology, not to establish doctrine, but to confirm good doctrine. So we look to the Holy Spirit-inspired New Testament, particularly the epistles, to give us meaning to our Christian faith and walk. And yet God has given us all kinds of stories and word pictures and poetry and many other genres of literature in the Old Testament to give us, uh, you know, to expand upon uh, the, the truth. Now, part of this, I just want to speak that the reasons 
for the value and also the need for it is uh, God ultimately, he himself, God, uh, Jesus spoke of God the Father and says, uh, God is spirit. And so God himself is spirit and lives in a spiritual realm, uh, which in the Hebraic biblical understanding is not totally divorced from the material realm, natural realm that we live. In fact, the two realms coexist and intermesh. And we have in the Hebraic biblical account, we have spiritual beings uh, appearing in the in the natural realm in different examples and types. And at times, in limited number of times, we have natural human beings find themselves caught up, as was the case with uh, Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, and others. Enoch was caught up to heaven. Uh, and and various visions the prophets have had. So these two worlds, uh, and uh, one way of seeing this, uh, which has helped me, I think, is uh, modern physicists have have determined that while we live in a four-dimensional uh, natural world, there's actually 10 or more, uh, and this is largely proven through mathematics and other modeling, that there are multiple dimensions, 10 or more, in reality. So in that 10-dimension world, 10-plus dimension world, both spirit and natural uh, coexist. And that's really the value of these stories. So coming back to the particular one we're looking at, we're looking at Noah and his family at the time of the flood. So uh, coming back to the text, we've already seen how the bulk of humanity was destroyed at the time of the flood because of their violence threaten God's purposes in Noah and his family. Still, God's judgment on the bulk of humanity at that time was slow in coming and without any scriptural evidence of anger, wrath, or fury on the part of the Lord. The story of Noah, the flood, and the ark are a wonderful typology for a new covenant one month, particularly our one month through kinship covenant, a kinship covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, including our baptizing, baptism into his death, resurrection, ascension, life and participation in the divine family as his eternal body and our eventual bodily resurrection and sun placement as a very spiritual temple of the Lord in the new heavens and earth. Uh, there's an end note there, but, and that's quite a full theology there about what I can say is this is pictured in the typology form in Noah and his family. So coming back to the text, we first read of Noah. I'm reading in Genesis 5, 28 and 29. Lamech. Now, this is not the same Lamech we were talking about earlier that uh, that had killed people out of anger and bragged about it. And and uh, this is uh, a different man in a different lineage by the name of Lamech. In fact, Lamech is in the lineage of Seth, and the other Lamech was in the lineage of Cain. So here we have uh, Lamech lived 120 182, pardon me, 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands from the ground of which the Lord has cursed. Uh, end of passage, that was Genesis, Genesis 5, 20 and 29. Uh, I'll just stick to the text here. Noah uh, Lamech, Noah's father is in Seth's lineage from Adam. This godly line includes Lamech's father, Methuselah, who had the longest life of any human, and grandfather, Enoch, who, quote, walked with God, end quote, and lived uh, 365 years and was not, for God took him. And that's in uh, Genesis 5.22. The name, the name Noah means rest. Noah's father said, this one will give us rest from our work and our trial over hands from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Directly related to God's curse upon the ground due to Adam's sin. We remember that from Genesis 3, 17. We talked about the judgment upon Adam and Eve. And among this were some curses, God cursing the ground, not cursing Adam, but cursing the ground. Uh, we covered that earlier. So in this sense, Noah can be seen as a type of Christ. Who has offered rest to all come to him, and also to remove the curse, uh, the curse that brought on by Adam's uh, sinful act of eating the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so that's a beautiful type uh, for eventually for this this other figure, Jesus Christ, not just a figure, a real real human being who walked incarnate God, God of God, man of man, and then of course uh, ascended and did all the full 
uh, the full work of Christ that we uh, that we'll cover uh, that you know that's part of our active faith in the living Christ. Uh, so Jesus said, now this is coming back to the role of Jesus in giving us rest. Jesus said, and this is Matthew 11, 28 through 29, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So what a beautiful picture there that Noah's name means rest. He's pointing ahead to the salvific work of Christ, who is going to deliver us from the toil and problems and all the baggage that Adam brought upon mankind with his sin. So coming back to the text, the word rest in scriptures refers first to God himself. As we read, this is in Genesis 2-2, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So all scriptural references to rest are rooted in the very Sabbath rest of God himself. This is reflected in Hebrew author's definition of rest for those of us in Christ. So I'm quoting Hebrews chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has also himself rested from his works, just as God did from his. You see the connection there. So resting in this biblical sense is a resting from effort, energy, and labor just like uh, Abraham then had the work by the sweat of his brow, now the rest represents, uh, you know, uh, more of a relaxed state. It doesn't mean idle, but the time is not spent laboriously. In fact, if you remember back, we talked about um, uh, the Greek word panaras, meaning, which is uh, quite often, most often translated the new, uh, most translation is evil. The real meaning of panaras, uh, evil, is uh, in English is full of labor and toil and trouble. See, and that's that's a picture of the human life outside of Christ, isn't it? So much worry and trouble and and uh, fretting. And of course, Christ came to share with us uh, abundant life and to deliver us from that uh, place of toil in our own strength. Now, with Him, that doesn't mean because Paul says. Uh, in the New Testament, he says uh, 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 that, uh, in, I'm trying to figure out, I remember the exact verse, but he talks about the grace that God has given him, and yet, he says, and yet he labors more than you all, meaning that it, even in the grace, he is able to uh, do uh, various works that the Lord has for him, but they're not burdensome to him because he's been given grace for what he was called to do. Let's go back now. In the text, we learn that, quote, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and that Noah walked with God, Genesis 6, 9. This is the first word, use of the word righteous in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? So here we have uh, the concept of resting and righteousness tied together. Uh, many people get this confused, as you know, confusing works and effort and energy put out on the human part to try to achieve and become righteous. But in Noah, we see, just as in Christ, that righteousness is identified with a resting, a resting in a place, a state of being, of being in right relationship. And that right relationship isn't just a, um, some people call that imputed righteousness. That's a term you might have heard. Uh, this is a true righteousness because the Holy Spirit himself has come in and indwelled us. And now we've been translated from this kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light where our our natural state of our spirit is a place of harmony and rest with the Lord. So um, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go further in that, but let's follow the text as we go here. So we read that uh, Noah was... Um, a righteous man, blameless in his time, Noah walked with God. And that this is the first word, use of the word righteous in the Bible. Noah sounds a lot, a lot like Jesus Christ to me. Noah is identified as righteous, but nothing is said of his family being righteous. Yet we see that God saved Noah and his entire family because of their relationship to Noah. A humanistic view of the story might tend to put ourselves in the place of Noah in the story, but it seems far more reasonable to put Jesus in the center of the story, who was and is 
the only perfectly blameless righteous one who walked and walks perfectly with God the Father. So all those who become related to Jesus are saved in the ark with and through his righteousness, not our own. All the members of Noah's family were saved because of Noah's righteousness, not their own. It was their relationship with Noah that ultimately saved them. And so it is with all those in Christ. So isn't that a beautiful picture? Uh, by their union with Noah, then they they received the full benefit that Noah did. Now, coming back to the text, the ark itself, then, is a type of those in Christ, that is, the body of Christ. Uh, God instructed Noah to, quote, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and outside with pitch. Uh, and the quote, quote uh, Genesis 6, 14. Wood in scriptures often symbolizes our humanity. And also, so the ark was made of wood, and that is typifying, uh, you know, and I'm talking about the ark now being uh, typologically the body of Christ, which is made up, of course, of humans. So the ark itself as a wooden structure is like the body of Christ. Now, I'm not, to be really clear here, I, I think you know this of how I write, I'm not talking about a church or a church building. Uh, I'm talking about that multi-membered body of Christ that Paul writes about, uh, both in uh, both uh, spiritual and living, and and some of us have gone on to, and are with the Lord right now. But it's an eternal body of Christ, but made up of human beings that that build this structure. Just like uh, Peter talks about us being the living stones in the in the uh, in the temple, and Paul says uh, uh, that we are whole, that we are the temple of God. Well, that's it no longer is this a tent out in the wilderness or a stone building in Jerusalem. We are now the temple of God ourselves because God resides. Why? God resides in us. We now are the place where God resides in the earth and all those who are born of his spirit and, and live in his spirit. OK, let's go on then. Uh, the Also, the ark was sealed with pitch, much as we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul speaks three times of being sealed with or by the Holy Spirit. And the references uh, for your sake are 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 22, and Ephesians 1, 13, and Ephesians 4, 3. This sealing by the Holy Spirit is not just individually, but corporally as the body of Christ. In the two cases of the mention of being sealed in Ephesians, the object of the sealing is you which could mean, the using the word you, which could mean you individually or you collectively as the body of Christ. The theme of the epistle of Ephesians, however, is clearly about the body of Christ and not about just individual Christians. So Paul is speaking throughout the epistle about the collective body of Christ. Paul also mentions the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in reference to their work for the collective body of Christ which is, quote, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. That's Ephesians 4.12. So this sealing then is that's uh, being typified by the sealing of the ark with the tar is, is, is a sealing on the body of Christ collectively by the spirit. Now I'm going to quote, I'm actually going to read you for 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, which I've cited earlier. Now he, that is God the Father, who establishes us with you in Christ, that is the body of Christ, and anointed us collectively, is God who also sealed us and gave us spirit in our hearts as a pledge. The apostle used the word us three times in the short passage, explaining the work of the Holy Spirit in sealing and anointing the collective body of Christ. There should be no question of his corporate understanding of our out one with others in the body of Christ. So as the family of Noah was collectively saved through their relationship with Noah from the destruction of the flood and ultimately given new life and a new earth, similarly, those related to Christ through new birth and include, are included in the body of Christ will be saved from perishing to a new life and ultimately in the new heavens and new earth. Sweet. What a picture of what one. So I, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but I think this is a, really a beautiful prefiguring of the body of Christ uh, being saved from death and destruction 
But it doesn't end there. Let's never end that story, nor us just being saved from something. We are saved for something. So the the um, in the book of Genesis, then Noah, as we know, when the waters receded, then came down. And it was as if he was in a new cleansed earth, cleansed by the flood. And he goes on and he and his family go on to lead new lives. Uh, and and then we find, of course, in um, the Semitic line, uh, Shem, then we find the biblical story continuing on to the point where uh, we have Abraham and the family of God, children of Israel, and then ultimately Christ himself born in the tribe of Judah. But all of that is to say that it was a new beginning, a new start. And that's when I'm talking about the new heaven and earth. Uh, we are not only saved from uh, destruction and death, but there is a bit, there's a long-term picture here in that new heaven and earth where we will have <clears throat> uh, resurrected bodies and function and whole new function of life, which uh, scriptures are fairly uh, terse. Uh, so I'm not going to ramble on too long about it. We simply know that it will be cleansed of, of any unrighteousness altogether, and it'll be harmonious uh, and it will be a rest for us, just as it is for God himself. So let's go on then. Um, by the way, uh, and I believe when we look at Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1, now this may be more than you want to hear, but I believe Genesis chapter 1 is a prologue for the biblical overview, God's overview of what he's going to do in his cosmos. And that seventh day that is described in Genesis 1, this is my my interpretation of that is pointed had him resting in that new heaven and new earth uh, uh, that God is still because Jesus says that he and the father still are at work right now. So he's not fully in his rest. And we hear in the, we read in the book of Hebrews, an example that Christ is seated, but he's waiting for the father to put all of his enemies under his feet so christ himself yet is not fully established yet because he there are still enemies that are not under his feet and once everything is done the house is clean we have new heaven and earth now god will at, be at rest in the new temple which will be us as resurrected a, a temple of god and and that again comes back to this whole notion of typology uh, i can't explain it because it's explaining a spiritual reality but that's a word picture for us of what uh, what it will be like, something of what it will be like. Okay, I've gone on maybe longer than I should. Now, the next subheading is Noah and his family's covenantal relationship with the Lord. If we stop our reading of the story of Noah and the ark with the salvation of Noah, his family, and the many animals that were on their course from the destruction of the flood, we risk not seeing the covenantal aspect of the Lord with Noah and, quote, all flesh, end quote, through the Noah covenant. So now I'm picking this up in Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. Now behold, I myself am establishing my covenant with you, that is with Noah, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the livestock and every animal on the earth, with you and of all that comes out of the ark, every animal of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. All flesh shall never again be eliminated by waters of a flood, nor shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Three dots. When the rainbow is in the cloud, then I'll look at it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature and of all flesh that is on the earth. Three dots. This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. End of passage. So we hear, see here that the Lord extends a covenantal relationship not only with Noah, but in the words of the Lord, quote, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. And quote, not to be misunderstood, this is not a covenant of eternal life as offered in the new covenant through Christ, but one of eternally limiting God's judgment, quote, upon all flesh that's on the earth. And very specifically, this covenant provides that only that, only that quote, all flesh shall never be eliminated by the waters of the flood, nor shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, end quote. Rather than call a glass half empty, I'd call this glass half full. The Lord here by covenant promises to constrain his future judgments to never again destroy all flesh by a flood. 
I'll take that as a gracious promise coming from gracious God, not as some binding oath to prevent God from being himself. To the contrary, the apostle Paul, Peter rather, describes God's patience, quote, as not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repent. Uh, repent, there's that metanoia, meaning the change of mind. And we read this in 2 Peter chapter 3 through 9, um, and he's relating back to this very incident himself, Know this, Peter writes, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, falling after their own lessons, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So there's a reference back to the Noahic flood. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, or for all to come to repentance, and that's metanoia, come to a, um, a change of mind. End of passage. The Apostle Peter reminds us that although the mercy and grace of the Lord was extended to all flesh through the Noahic covenant, there still remains a future judgment. However, the Apostle Peter points to the, quote, slow to anger, wrath of God, and God's desired for none to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is among his usual ways, repentance as transformation through metanoia. And I'm going to repeat here a couple of verses from the New Testament, Romans 2, 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Okay, again, we've seen that before. The guy, it's God's kindness that brings about this repentance. So this is a factor in God's slowness to anger. He is allowing uh, consequences to turn people around, to turn them to him. And that in that, then he can be, he can meet with them where they're at. And then he can bring salvation and he can bring healing and ultimately full redemption for those to turn to him. And then uh, Second uh, Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow, godly sorrow brings repentance, that's metanoia, that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Now, we, I think we've talked about this before, but I love this, that the sorrow that God allows to happen uh, in life uh, can have two, two results to it. One, where, where it is leading repentance and salvation, that, that it can be used to change hearts and minds, to turn to God, resulting in union, a relationship, and even eternal life and transformation, I might add, because God does allow, Romans 8, 28 says, he causes all things to work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose, so that, uh, and who he predestined, he predestined to become conformed to his image, the image of his son, that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. So we see this working away now, which is a uh, difficult can be a difficult uh, age to live in for many that it can be used for good especially for this good of bringing us in relationship then transform us in the image of Christ however and this is we know this is a very common human condition that but worldly sorrow that that is not combined with faith in Christ looking to God turning to God in the apostle Paul writes uh, brings death and there is no other that it has no good end to it. So, of course, we encourage people to in in their trouble, turn to the Lord and receive uh, a change of mind about the Lord. Look to him to see him as the source of salvation and, and need. OK, let's go on. So how does the story of Noah, his family and the ark relate to God's wrath? Like the story of Noah and his family being saved from destruction from the flood. Our salvation in Christ is described as being saved from destruction. Quote, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. End of passage. Yet yeah, more than 
escape from death and destruction is involved in our salvation. It's the beginning of an entirely new life. The ark being tossed in the sea and eventually landing on new ground is a type of baptism. And Paul writes in Rome, and I'm going to quote Paul, Apostle Paul, Romans 6, verses 3 for 5, 5. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Why were we baptized? Why did we go into that? Death? He says, so that we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united in the likeness of death, certainly we'll also be of his resurrection. End of passage. So the typology of Noah, the ark and his family, does not end in just a saving from death alone, but one of an entirely new life and a new cleansed environment. And as to future judgments identified as a day of wrath and final judgment, I'll pick up those cases in uh, chapter 17. But what I'm just trying to emphasize here in this typology is that uh, that God does not just leave it in death, but our our burial in baptism is symbolizing, just like Noah going in that ark, being saved, and coming out uh, into a fresh whole new world in resurrection. It was So the next heading is, was God wrathful under the Noah covenant? I challenge you to see any anger, wrath, or fear on God, fury on God's part in any aspect of this story. To the contrary, we can see the heart of the Lord in making a new and gracious covenant with Noah and, quote, and all flesh that is on the earth, quote. Once again, while we see judgment for some at the time of the flood and even for others at the day, a future day of the Lord, there is no indication of any anger, wrath, or fury on the Lord's part, but rather a heart not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. We quoted that passage, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 9. Chapter 13, Summary, God's Wrath Under the Noahic Covenant. We looked at Noah as a type of Christ, the ark as a type of the body of Christ, and Noah's family as a type of those joined into the righteous one, Jesus Christ. His righteousness, Christ, extends to all who are joined to him in kinship relationship through the new covenant. This not only includes being saved but from perishing, but ultimately a new life and a new world where man's sinfulness has been erased. Scripture never mentions any rules, laws, law keeping, or demonstrated righteousness on the part of Noah's family. Simply by re being related to Noah, they were saved and given a new life. A beautiful picture of what we have in Christ through regeneration, inclusion in the divine family through new covenant of one. So I think that's a good enough statement to that is the end of the chapter and let me wrap this up with a final prayer so heavenly father lord jesus and holy spirit uh i'll just thank you first of all as i read this account we thank you for the marvelous um fact that you have brought us into christ that just like the ark we are now delivered from the destruction but also we look forward to that whole cleansed environment which will ultimately lead to a new heaven and new earth in the meantime, we're protected, we're held in the ark, we're in your hands, and we just thank you for this privileged position uh, that we find ourselves in through Christ. And so in this and all things, we pray that we would see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and walk with you more nearly, uh, individually and as a body of Christ, uh, both today and from here forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you.